On today's Wall Street Wildlife, we talk about long-term investing. We dig into a topic we said we'd talk about last week and we didn't quite get to because there was so much on the docket. But we are definitely this week going to talk about the inexorable rise of renewables and whether the sector is investable. And also, Snowflake is suddenly in Christoph's too hard bucket. So we're going to dig into why that might be. A bit of a worry for me because I'm also a Snowflake shareholder. Today is Monday, the 2nd of September. And you, no doubt, have been up to no good because it, it was the weekend. Let me uh, guess. No, it was tame, very tame. I, actually, I did go to my brother's 50th birthday party, which is superb fun. Horse racing with a Ministry of Sound after party. And I was betting extensively on the horses. I did not see a freaking horse or a four-legged thing anywhere that day. It was mostly the dance floor and the booze. But still, nice to go to the races. Yeah. And then... Uh, yeah, and just doing some gardening and some regular at-home stuff on Sunday. What have you been getting up to? Right. The, you, you're, I keep calling you a man of mystery. The man who's capable of going to a horse race, not seeing a single horse, <laughs> but yeah. ending, ending up on the dance floor. You live a charmed life. Whereas I, somehow I ended up talking for four or five hours at night to a really learned political theory expert that I know through my other life as a philosopher uh, and pontificator. And it, it really, I mean, this guy is just so fun to talk to, but probably the most expert in politics of anybody I know. And it's striking when you actually talk to someone that's spent, devoted their lives to, you know, reading all of the things and knows what they're talking about in regard to politics versus what we get. 99.9% .9 of the time, which is people mouthing off based on, you know, their latest thoughts and feelings. And it's like a whole nother universe. It's like opening a portal to, oh my God, there's substance here. So it was a late night <laughs> thought okay. about Marx and capitalism. And <laughs> <laughs> Did he have any key insights that our listeners might take away? Yeah, the surprising thing is... I don't know how to say this without reducing an incredibly complex thing, which is actually that's one of the key insights, to, to be honest. If you want to talk about these topics, you need at least three hours to properly define terms, to not jump to immediate conclusions. And that's what nobody is willing to do. And that's why we have this cluster beep of a situation. Because people are talking past each other. So when you talk to an expert, he's like, okay, slow down. This is what I mean by this term, right? In this case, like liberal, what does it mean to be liberal? Well, it used to mean one thing in 1750, but then it meant something else in the 1800s. Now it means something else entirely. And who, who the hell knows what term you're using unless you slow down. So that's, that's worth saying that's enough. I won't say why, but uh, you got me reading a book at the moment and I've had to I've got a physical copy of the book as opposed to it being digital as I usually go. And normally if there's like a term I don't understand, I just like click and then Google explains this thing to me. So I've had to be going off separately to understand what this morning, what neoliberalism is, because that's been coming up in the book. And I'm like, I don't actually know what this means. So I think I now do. Yeah. And that's a really important term, uh, especially in our political moment right now. And it will, understanding that term will infect investing outcomes. Very so good. I can't wait for, for you to explain to us what it means. <laughs> I'll go and refresh that uh, once more. Anyway, I was, maybe I was caught up in some neoliberalism of my own. Uh, I've got a speeding fine, Christoph, for the first time in bloody a decade. I've got a bloody speeding fine here. Which is shocking. It is yeah. absolutely shocking. I would have put the odds of you getting a speeding fine or like uh, the, the regularity of it like approximately once a month. <laughs> Uh, I, uh, I had in the UK we get something called points. If you get twelve points, that's like you've won. You've won the big prize, which is a ban for like six months. Oh. Uh, and I once got to eleven points. I was at eleven <laughs> points for a couple of years, but that definitely calmed me down. In fact, it was that like gaggle of nearly twelve points that switched me from cars to motorbikes, and then started my you know my career as a motorcyclist. Wait, but, but well, hold on. But what rationale does a man getting speeding tickets turn to motorcycles to slow down? Because well, back in those days, you had to start on like a weedy little no bike with more than a one two 125cc engine. 
So I had like a little one, two, five to pass my test. I think, oh yeah, that will like slow me down. And it, that did, but obviously, you know, there were subsequent bikes that had like 10 times the capacity. Um, but yeah, I was just, you know, I was trying to be a safe, smart, progressive rider. But anyway, this is in the bloody Tesla going to uh, Plymouth. I knew the guy on this gantry way with his gun. I knew he got me as I went past him anyway. So uh, I'm very much hoping that Avon and Somerset police take mercy on my 86 miles an hour in a 70. And oh. they uh, they give me a speed awareness course. I'll definitely be happy to take one of those. Let's see, if, let's see what prize arrives in the post in the next couple of days. <laughs> you know, 86, I said, that's not that bad. I thought we were going to get something like that. <laughs> yeah, it was really, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't trying to get anywhere in a hurry. I was just getting to my destination anyway. You know what? If that was me, if I was the cop pulling you over and you showed me some tears, I would have let you go. I did once get out of a speeding fine on the motorcycle, coming home at like 2 a.m. from the city and been playing like like a poker game on a Tuesday night. And there's a section of road that's just like fields as I was coming home. And I was doing like 40 something and it's, it's actually a 30. I was doing like 45. Got pulled over by some guy in the bushes and he asked me you know like very pointedly about like am i aware of the speed da, da, da. i was very didn't try and talk myself out of it no tears i just accepted the uh, the situation i was very contrite and apologetic and uh, i was quite thoughtful and when i i think i won him over when he was like you know where are you going at this time of night and i said i've just come from a poker game and uh, he looked bemused and we chatted about the poker game a little bit i think he might have been a poker player and then he let me off with a slap on the wrists and a telling off. So thank you, officer. <laughs> uh, last thing I'd ever want to see is a sad badger. So, Well, maybe I should be a sad badger because I've been calling myself a long-term investor for really the last 20 years. And it's only recently that I've managed to pull together some data that either supports or undermines this. I thought I'd take you through it. And I've got a question for you at the end. Am I actually a long-term investor? Now, do you know what an average holding period is? Just in general or yours? Do you, you, know, you know what it means? Or do you, know, you, you never know how you would calculate one? Because it turns out it's a damn sight more complicated than you might think. Yeah, who's, who's compiling the data? Yeah, t t talk me through it. I don't know. Yeah, so if you want to work out, what the average holding period in your own portfolio is, you have to match up your buys and your sells and say, how long did I own that many units of stock? So let's say, for example, something like, I don't know, Google. I've bought that four or five times over the years. I don't think I sold it. But I might have sold a little bit and then rebought a little bit. And you've got this mess of transactions and I've still got like a big chunk of it now. How do I work out what my average holding period is? So I spent ages trying to build a complex spreadsheet to figure this out. And then I went, screw it. Actually, this is just proving to be a nightmare and I'm not smart enough with spreadsheets to do this. Unlike, by the way, Boo Boo Kitty on the Seven Investing Discord, who it seemingly has built such a complex network of multiple spreadsheets. He's basically like rebuilt Morningstar in Excel, I think. Anyway, my Excel skills or my Google Sheet skills are far inferior to, uh, to his, but I do have ChatGPT. So what I was able to do was just export all of my transactions. And I got ChatGPT to work it out for me. And I checked if it was right. And I'm pretty confident that it's on the nose. So when I match up all my buys and sells, ChatGPT tells me that the average holding period in my portfolio is 3.7 years. So on average, when I buy a stock, I hold it for about three and a half years. Some stuff, obviously, I've got much longer. Some stuff... And that's quite interesting which ones, and I'll share a couple of them, I've held for much shorter. And so I thought this might be a uh, interesting thing to dig into. That, I think, puts you squarely in the long-term camp, obviously. I mean, I don't think it's any doubt, but three and a half years seems, it actually seems satisfying, like a satisfying number. Anytime I ever talk to people about investing, I immediately use the three to five years. Like you buy something and it's three to five. So far, you haven't said anything that, that surprises me, really. I expected it to be much longer. Like my longest hold is Intuitive Surgical, the first company I ever bought, and I haven't sold a single share. So it seems I've owned that for 17.8 years now because I was doing some investing before that, but it was all indexes. That was the first actual stock in the single company investment I bought. But I've got a couple of short ones as well that are quite interesting. So my three shortest holds, 
Solar Edge at 339 days, Illumina at 378 days, and Enphase at 388 days. So two of those three are solar energy stocks, Enphase and Solar Edge. And I've said that, that really surprised me. And I, it's true, that's definitely the case. I'm surprised I've only held my solar stocks for less than a year each. I don't own either of those today. So that is interesting in your context. However, in in the investing world, a year is not considered short term by any stretch. I mean, everything's relative, but some people, when they say short term, they're talking about weeks, you know, sure. even out of someone who calls himself a long term investor, yeah. a year is definitely not long term either. I guess you, you've nailed it, right? Because three to five years, because you need to, if you're a long term investor, like I, my sort of pride of my profession is build an investment thesis, give it years to play out, like might take three, three to five years for the thesis to play out, and then, you know, monitor it along the way. I've clearly given up on these two in around a year. So I've barely given them a chance to prosper. Yeah, so this is interesting. This point is interesting. When I hear you say that, it's a little bit of the, you, like a good carpenter, you measure twice, you cut once, right? So if you do the right amount of work up front, it's only some like horror thing. Either something goes horribly wrong with fraud or the company blows up in some unexpected way, right? Yeah, good, good observation. And I'm pretty sure I screwed up with Enphase because I didn't really think clearly enough about the impact of a high rate inflationary environment when I picked that stock and bought it in my own portfolio and the environment bit the stock. I mean, essentially what the company does is it sells solar systems and power batteries to homeowners and small businesses. And it's like homeowners that need to take out loans typically to buy their solar installation. It's like a high capex project it might cost you like twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. So you're probably not going to pay cash for that. You might need a loan to do that, some home improvement grant or something. And in a high rate environment, like money's expensive. So people were spending less uh, on improving their house in that way, because it's kind of discretionary. You don't need to stick solar on. And uh, the company suffered. Maybe it's coming out of that now if rates do come down later this month. But anyway, I'm, I'm still on the sidelines of this one now. I smell a contradiction here because I was going to bring this up. The rate, call it a uh, mistake, happened to have, it just happened to have occurred at the beginning of your holding period. But we know that rates go in cycles and that they're going, they're on their way down. So it doesn't make sense to me based on your explanation that that because nothing else has really changed about the company, it seems to me like you're saying you picked a poor time. But if you actually had a long-term investment sentiment about this, you would just say, okay, well, the stock declined because of the poor timing, but it's going to rebound as the rates drop, as you just yourself said. So I don't know if this was, this seems to me like a little bit of short-term thinking rather than long-term thinking. That's a good challenge. I think there were other reasons as well. I sold that one mid-June this year, and I, in my notes, I said, poor results, lack of confidence in management, that's kind of damning, and a Republican leadership may inhibit Inflation Reduction Act. So you know, with, if the Republicans get in November, it's probably not going to help that sector. And in, at the time, inflation wasn't looking like it was going to be coming down. You know, we've moved on a little bit in the last couple of months, and maybe the ship has turned. Maybe we're now seeing much higher confidence that rates are going to drop. Yeah, essentially, I'd lost faith in management, and I felt like probably there was more bad news on the horizon. So m newer me as an investor is trying to be a bit more ruthless in terms of cutting the weeds rather than sitting on somewhat broken investments and like waiting for them to turn around. Yeah, maybe this is one of those times where you don't want to be rigid about long-term versus yeah. short-term because those are meant to be guidelines. Yeah. Obviously, yeah. you're a long-term investor. Obviously, that's the main principle you draw from. Even if technically you might have violated that in this case, you provide pretty decent reasons for getting out of the position and you could always buy back if some of those things go away, right? 
because we start getting cute. I mean, one of the mistakes I've made repeatedly is like, you know, trying to be too smart for our own good. But then one of the ways we do that is by being too rigid in how we identify. So I, I don't blame you for selling. I'm merely saying I think it's a little bit out of line with your with the rest of your philosophy. And that unless it was the I mean, I followed this company a little bit too, and I never lost trust of management. So I don't know what you're referring to. It certainly wasn't fraud, anything. No, I seem to remember listening to one of the earnings calls a couple of months ago and feeling like the CEO who's Badri something, Badri Kotamandu, something like that. And it just sounded like a litany of excuses. It didn't sound like strong leadership that really had a handle on the company. So yeah, maybe maybe some soft things as well as some hard things that really made me think, like I don't I don't trust this company with my dollars anymore. Which is kind of a shame. And maybe like our next topic on today's episode might turn me around on that a little bit because we are going to dig into energy and renewables. Yeah, let's talk about that. I found a chart that showed that renewable energy is surpassing coal energy for the very first time. And to me, that, you know, for the very first time, that's a big deal. That's an inflection point and all that. So you then took that chart and ran with it. What else do you have to say about that? Yeah, like I've, we'll pop the chart up on here. And as you can see, in these forecasts from the International Energy Agency, they're forecasting renewables as a supply of total global energy production to be exceeding coal in 2025 based on current trajectory and i found some other supporting evidence that seems to back that up and this other graph shows that uh, in 2023 the world installed an additional 428 gigawatts of solar capacity Mm -hmm. specifically so like solar as one part of the renewables picture and that was like nearly double the prior year's installation so like solar is compounding very fast and becoming a significant part of that energy generation equation. I think this is great. And it takes a lot of the politics out of energy because it can like fracking and environment and climate change, like they've become incredibly politically charged topics. And really this just boils it down to pure economics. Like solar is winning because it is now the cheapest form of power generation and when paired with an always on source like nuclear, something like that, like this is a, a cheap, reliable way of supplying your energy grid. So I think this is the right way for renewables to win, to win on cost rather than just like we're going to save the planet and be like these green eco warriors. Indeed. Now I'm going to torture you a little bit. It's been a little, it's usually the badger torturing poor monkey, but I'm going to, I'm going to flip the script. Can you give our listeners a, a, a bull case for EOS energy based on what you just said? <laughs> well, that little shit co in your portfolio, no chance, buddy. That's, uh, that's all yours. <laughs> you, you really can't. You, you, you can't even, you have no, no idea how, how what we were just talking about segues into my beloved. Go on, I, go on. I, will, I will turn, I will, I will uh, withdraw the veto on talking about EOS for the next one minute. You may not talk about it for the next month on the podcast, but come on then, tell us, tell us again why you're in EOS, Paul. Okay, well, this is in, in a broad sense. The Economist wrote a feature last week, I think, titled Clean Energy's Next Trillion Dollar Business. Grid scale batteries are taking off at last is the yeah. subheading. Now, that's not EOS specific, but obviously EOS is a battery company that is in the whole point is to take all this, this influx of renewable energy and help utilities store it so that everything runs better. I found a post on LinkedIn that said the following in response to this clean energy is the next trillion dollar business. This uh, fellow is, his name is Alessandro Blasi. Uh, And he wrote, first were renewables, then came electric vehicles, and now it is time for batteries. There is no energy technology growing faster than battery storage with numerous providers by IEA's work on future of batteries being simply astonishing. And the race for a multi-trillion dollar business has started. So I think to me, you know, I've said this 
multiple times. I mean, there's the problems with EOS as a small company and all of the shenanigans they had to deal with. But I think I was really right in maybe a little early because I started looking into this uh, two years ago, a year and a half. Yeah, almost two years ago. Uh, I knew or I sensed that the next huge investing opportunity is exactly in this sector and it's all sort of coming true. So um, I think that for any investor listening to our podcast, you are at the earliest of stages of what I think is a massive inflection point. And there will be many companies that succeed in this industry, EOS obviously being my favorite horse at the moment. But things like Enphase and uh, other renewables are certainly other horses you could look more deeply into. Yeah, and I don't want to turn this into a, a politics conversation, but I do think like the future in that sector is going to be dictated to some extent by whichever party gets into power in November. So I'm probably not going to be getting back into renewables as an investment myself until I kind of say which way the wind blows. And you know, even if that's like the Republicans taking power, it'd be just nice to see what their new policies say specifically about renewables, because now it's like economically unarguable that this is the right way to proceed. So maybe they just kind of get behind that anyway, because it's like it's superior form of power generation. Yeah. And you know what? I also think there's a little bit more of a gray area in the political sector because of the, there's so much that is now more bipartisan, including all the energy needed for AI and data storage yeah. stuff. But take this as an example. I, I know from listening Musk's uh, banter and recent shift toward the right, how he's now a Trump supporter, but Trump was on record for hating electric vehicles. But of course, these two guys are ta- you know, talking in the shadows, as it were. And Musk said publicly, you know, Tesla will be just fine under Trump. And it's one of those things where maybe it's like too big a wave to fully turn off. And yes, maybe it won't be as accelerated, but I don't think this particular industry will suffer regardless of who takes office. Let's 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 then pivot to the question I posed in the intro was which was like renewables are coming, but is this investable? And I I think we probably have to take Tesla off out of the conversation because I, I kind of agree with you. Tesla are probably going to do just great whichever way the political winds blow for next year. But the rest of the renewable sector could suffer. And if I think back to why I got out of solar edge and maybe to a lesser extent, why I got out of Enphase, it's because like Tesla's the Tesla energy is becoming like a bigger energy is becoming a bigger part of the Tesla thesis. Maybe this stuff is commoditized, right? Really, it's just like you, okay, you've got like an app which has got like a brand on it, but essentially you've just got like solar panels on your roof. You've got an inverter, or maybe there's slightly different technologies, mm-hmm. but at the end of the day, you know, you just want to power like your oven and your aircon and your PC, right? You don't really care. Electrons are electrons. You don't care how you got them, whether they're Tesla branded electrons or Enphase branded electrons. So it's just like the cheapest and most reliable system that's going to win. And like Tesla has just got a knack of delivering vertically integrated solutions that are just better than the competition, cheaper than the competition. Like they've proven that with cars and Musk has proven that with space and uh, like in a number of other domains, maybe not digging holes in the ground. So maybe my fear as well with Enphase and Solar Edge was like Tesla are going to come along and gobble them up as their energy sector becomes bigger. Yeah, that's a fair argument. One reason I'm not worried at all about EOS is scale. I think EOS right now, were it to be running in full capacity, even with the future projected lines, two, three, and four, they would still only be able to capture something like 4% of the total need. And so it's like, even if if demand was cut in half somehow, it wouldn't even matter. So we shall see. But I think the summary for me is we're, we're, we're at an inflection point and there are many companies positioned to take immense advantage of this inflection point. And it's good for the planet and it's good for global warming and it's just a sector in the industry and something to really pay attention to and i think we should touch on briefly nuclear it's a small part of the energy equation if i pop that graph back up 
like today, nuclear is about 3,000 terawatts of our total energy supply. But today, like that's almost all of that 3,000 terawatts is like big legacy nuclear reactors, actually mostly in China because they're building so many of them so fast. And there's an investment that I've also sold in the last few months, which is a company called New Scale Power. And they were one of the only public companies developing small modular reactors, SMRs, and actually SMR was their ticker. I've got out of that just because they run like a horrible cash burn. It's still a long, long time until they really bring their technology to commercial scale, which is probably now, it pushed out a little bit. It's probably now going to be like the early 2030s. When I was looking at an investment, when I bought them, it was looking like 2028, 2029. It pushed out for various reasons, eventually lost one of their key customers. And the whole nuclear equation is going to change, I think, in the 2040s mm. when fusion power becomes commercially viable. And like, I don't want to turn this into a science fiction segment, but like fusion is going to take us to a post-scarcity society. Like today, even with the tremendous advances in renewables, like power still costs money. At some point, though, in the, in the next 30 years, let's say, we'll have essentially limitless free energy. And you know, we're going to need that to power like the incredible size data centers that we're going to need to run like the AI of the 2050s and everything else. So like, you, we'll all be getting our power for free almost everywhere in the world, certainly in the developed world. And that's going to be enabled by probably by fusion. By then, you and I will be nothing but digital avatars. <laughs> it will be... <laughs> <laughs> we need a ton of terawatts just to power that virtual monkey brain. <laughs> but what, what am I? What am I waffling about? Like to bring that together? Like if you if you've got these companies still trying to create small modular reactors, which is like an iteration, a very sensible iteration on fission, which is like the way nuclear power works today, but they're just much smaller mini reactors as opposed to these giant twenty year projects that it takes to build. Well, those companies only have like probably at most a 20 year window to make money and then they're going to be legacy technology. So if you are a really long term investor and you're taking like a 40, 50 year view, maybe this sector is uninvestable just because the whole thing is going to change so dramatically once we have the advent of stable controlled fusion that we can scale out commercially that everything else is going to fall by the wayside. Right. And there's the tension in maximizing investing returns. If you're a long-term investor, eventually, if you're right, you, you will be, I mean, if your thesis plays out, you'll be right. Uh, but there's that cost, uh, the cost of waiting. Yep. But on the other hand, you make most of your money if you're one of the first in, in an industry where you could buy it for pennies and it ends up being a massive win. I typically make mistakes by being too early. And so I'm trying to, in, based on everything you said, I would rather at this point wait for the science fiction aspects to become a little bit more grounded before making an investment in a sector like this. Whereas with the battery stuff, yeah. that's now physically happening. So big yeah. difference. Hey, look, I would never argue with anybody who's got a thesis that's going to play out in, say, over a 20 year period and like all the, any thesis around energy is still going to be intact over the next 20 years but at some point we are going to see a news article that really tips us over and we, like the first lab that's actually generating net power from fusion and as, as soon as we see a, a news like that and it's maybe been uh, recreated by a few other labs then it's just an engineering problem at that point to get us to um to commercial scale and the nature of growth investments is like they're going to get hit hard as soon as the market decides, yes, this is the future. Mm -hmm. Indeed. That sounds like a wrap, yes? Uh, I think so, yes. I think so. I wanted to talk about Snowflake. Actually, before we do, I do want to remind our listeners to give us a like and a subscribe and go drop us a comment. And we do read all the comments. And there's one very interesting one from someone who seems to be firmly in Team Monkey. Shall I... Uh, Shall I pick up what Emma Taylor had to say about our 
episode 41. Now, a quick reminder, episode 31, we closed with a bit of a debate about the king of the jungle portfolio, which we're going to touch on at the end of today's episode and see where we're at and who will be winning. And so Emma says, for what it's worth, I vote for you, Badger, giving Monkey a two-week grace period, essentially uh, give you an extra couple of two weeks so that your next set of coherence quarterly results can come in and your thesis can hopefully play out and you might be able to win the contest as your like half your portfolio is in damn coherence. Emma makes a, a convincing argument. She says, the reasons you might want to do this, look at it as a gesture of confidence in your Wall Street wildlife portfolio. Well, I am confident, Emma, in my portfolio. And two, you may have to ask Monkey for the same kindness in the future. Mm-hmm. That don't wash with me, mate. <laughs> oh, and look at it as a behavioral follow-up to your stand against the compassionless Disney in the world. Uh-huh. Sorry, Emma. This is, this is, I'm a poker player. That's falling on hard ears. We made a bet. Christoph could buy the extra two weeks, but it's going to cost him. You see, you see what I'm dealing with here, listeners? Cold-blooded claws and zero compassion. But don't worry. Things aren't looking great at the moment. <laughs> but I still have one more ace up my sleeve, which uh, I'm not, I don't know if I want to reveal. But I don't think it's over till it's over. Which, by the way, the deadline you said is, uh, I mean, the first round. What did we say? Is it October 31st? Is that the marker? Uh, why not? I think it's October 20-something, but we'll call it October 31st, Halloween. Yep. Well, let's call yeah, that the, the deadline. Yep. Right. We start technically a few days before the month, right? But yep. to make it, but our ads are the first of every month, right? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. Yep. so market value at the end of October 31st is, yep. the, is the finale. Okay. It will be a hollow victory if you take the lead in like the final few days of October, but I'll give you that. I'll give you that. Oh, okay. (laughs) Well, thank you, Badger. Uh, Emma, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that you're poignant and beautiful and wise and compassionate and ethical and moral argument fell on deaf ears. I'm compassionate other than when it comes to betting and gambling. You get no compassion for me there. Anyway, uh, if you're enjoying the pod, go like and subscribe, hit those buttons, and do send us a comment. We do read every single one. The best place to find us is on the Twitters. I'm at 7 Luke Hallard. I am at 7 Flying Platypus. We also have a wallstreetwildlife.com website where you could find all the links to all the shows and YouTubes and the up to the date king of the jungle portfolio and a pdf about the 10 principles that we abide by give us a comment on any of those and you'll definitely get a shout out and if you give us a five star review and a comment on apple or spotify we'll be especially grateful and also if you don't mind sharing our podcast with a friend that is already an investor or might want to become an investor our whole intention is to be investor beginner friendly and to no question is too naive or too silly for us to consider so i think we make a good team in in helping onboard folks to begin their investing journeys so if you have not thought about who you might share the episode with it might change their financial lives for the better we hope let's hope so let us know if you if you would like us to do this because i did get a request from a buddy uh, he said he was going to share one of the episodes of the podcast with his daughter, who is trying to get interested in investing. And so made me think we haven't really done an investing for your kids discussion for quite some time. I think we may have done that on a previous podcast many years ago, and maybe even to do a one-off ep- bonus episode that is specifically for your kids. Maybe we have to dress up in monkey and badger outfits for that one, try and make it a bit more fun and uh, and reflect on some kind of kid-friendly companies and talk about what it means to be an investor so if you'd like that like give us a comment specifically and let us know and if there's enough momentum for that and you think that would land and you something you might find useful well if we get enough calls for it we'll definitely do it absolutely okay back to the investing world i would like to riff a little bit on snowflake you're familiar with the company because you're an owner i am not 
but this is one of the companies I recommended for seven investing. So uh, over a year and change ago. So at one point, I would say I felt pretty confident in my understanding of it and the investing thesis, uh, why I thought it was going to beat the market for a long time. I also remember feeling when I was a shareholder, being very, very bullish on this company. I thought this was one of the best ideas that I had for all kinds of reasons. But the main one being uh, something like, you know, the world is moving towards information and that information needs to be stored somewhere. So the company that has the most, say, sophisticated and ground up place for that information, what you could then do with that information, that's the next generation platform. And that was going to be Snowflake. It did not hurt my investment thesis to find out that Warren Buffett himself, who never invests in software companies, broke his rule and made an exception for Snowflake. Fast forward to today. I am honestly, I, I want to go on the record and say this was one of the most um, disappointing investments of my career. The share price is down from below where it was at the IPO price. Valuation was always an issue. The latest earnings reports compressed valuation further, even though the numbers on their own were good. But that's besides the point. This is one of these companies where today, when I read up about it and I try to follow the story, the best I could say is I don't understand it anymore. I no longer have the capacity to truly say, separate, say, fact from fiction. And if I read a bull case, I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, that could happen. But then I read a bear case and I'm like, oh, yeah, hmm, that, that doesn't sound good. And I'm left in this position where because I'm not an expert uh, inside in the tech company working on these problems, I have no effing idea, honestly. And I, I wanted to, to underscore this by reading to you a, a little bit of a blurb from somebody named Parmad Gosavi. This was published, I think it was on LinkedIn. And he said, uh, this is an unpopular point of view on Snowflake. In my humble opinion, Snowflake has two problems. Structural, Snowflake should have followed the same playbook as Salesforce by buying up adjacent businesses to support the main cause. But Frank Slootman did not do this. He did not essentially miss the platform opportunity, says, says this fellow. And, quote, he might have misjudged Snowflake from his experience at ServiceNow, which is a true sticky platform. Snowflake should have acquired Confluent and Grafna Labs and Altion, a company I don't know, to name a few. Also should have aggressively consolidated the modern data st stack to box out Databricks cheaper alternatives, so on and so forth. I fear it is too late now. So that's bear case one, structural problem. Two, tactical. He says, Databricks is competing with a cheaper data lake and multiple query engine options. Also, currently customers went, want, quote, generative AI solutions. And with a legacy of structured data, Snowflake is not the first place customers look for AI. Okay, all I'm saying here is that all of that sounds thought out and uh, it doesn't sound trolly to me. It sound like, sounds like it's backed up by somebody who's who knows what they're talking about. But the problem is I am not that someone. And I don't know how, I wanna turn this over to you because in situations like this, I want to believe, but how can I know for sure? You know, like the, the whole claim that Databricks is a better... I've heard this from multiple angles, by the way, including people who work for Microsoft and saw this happening, but I'm not on the inside. So how do I evaluate these claims unless I, you know, took weeks of my life and somehow, you know, took crash courses in this kind of stuff and learned this technology. But even then, it's changing so fast that I'm like, how could I keep up with this? Okay, it's interesting. I was just, as you were talking, I just popped it up on finchat.io. Just have a look at some of the numbers and remind myself. Like, yeah, absolutely. There's, here's the... Uh, can you see my cursor? You can. Yeah, so we can see like the valuation has collapsed really in the last year or so. Now, to your question of 
do you need to be an expert in the company to be an investor in it? I firmly think the answer to that is no, you don't. Like I'm invested in a whole range of technologies, like mostly tech companies, and I'm not a practitioner in any of those things. But I think I have a decent handle on what the customers need and like at least whether the product is in demand. And I've my due diligence is out of date on Snowflake. And I, I think I said to you pre-recording, like across everything in my portfolio, this is probably certainly in the group of the ones I understand the least. And I seem to remember, I remember seeing your your seven investing pitch for it. And I think it was a combination of that plus a news headline I read around the time that they'd formed a strong partnership with NVIDIA. And it seemed like the partnership seemed to make sense. NVIDIA is like the engine and data is like the oil. And then you get these incredible results at the back end. So that partnership made a ton of sense to me. And I think those those two or three things at the time turned me into a buyer. But it's a small position. I've only bought it once. I've not added to this. Like it's something I'll often buy a one or a one or two percent position in something without knowing a huge amount about it and then building my due diligence. Now, the reason I say, though, you don't need to be an absolute expert in the technology, like you don't have to become a data scientist to invest in AI, is I think as an investor, you can start to see some things in the numbers that are concerning. So I'm going to fess up and say I haven't looked at this stuff for Snowflake for at least six months. But just looking at it right now, like I'm alarmed by the, the money, how much they're spending on OPEX. So if you, if you can see these numbers, like, okay, if their revenue uh, in the prior full year was $2.8 billion, and they spent $1.7 billion on SG&A, like sales, and so that's like not a good story, right? Essentially, you're having to buy revenue. You're spending more than half of your revenue or buying more revenue. That isn't a story that says to me, like a company has a great in-demand product that customers are just kind of lapping up and buying more and more of. You're actually out there having to sell it quite hard. So that's a big concern. And like, there's probably a bunch of other stuff in there. I won't try and do like a deep analysis of this live on the podcast, yeah. but... um. <laughs> Like this is, you've, you've at least reminded me that this is one I definitely need to take a closer look at myself. I want to push back against what you said. Not that what you said, I think I disagree with. I actually thought, looked at, I did look at, I did look at the, the numbers from the last quarter. I thought they were actually good, but it's all relative to the valuation. We have to remember, we also know that they have a badass competitor in Databricks that yep. appears from my, you know, minimal understanding or uncomfortable understanding seems to be a legitimate competitor. So this is not one of those situations where, I mean, th th this is, this is uh, you know, the edge of where the future. So you have to invest, I think, full throttle. My point for this segment is a little bit different. I'm saying that even if the, the numbers are, say, good or bad, and we could, you know, do play some financing games, the bigger problem is that with technology changing as fast as it is, I will never know the moment a technology be like this becomes obsolete until it's too late. So it's not about necessarily, I think it's a little different from saying I have to know the company inside and out. I don't think anybody knows really like what's going on on the insides of Databricks and Snowflake unless they're professionals at it because it's too friggin' hard and convoluted and complicated and ever evolving. So I go back to like something like Kodak, right? Big company sells film, then all of a sudden digital comes along and Kodak becomes extinct. That's easy for me to sort of understand and sort of predict in a way. Once I sniff out, there's a, something called digital cameras. I'm like, oh, with this stuff, how would I know? Is, is the point I'm making. I think the numbers can tell you, right? You, like we don't know much about, Databricks finances because it's a private company. So you're not going to get like a quarterly earnings report to do a comparison. But if they are eating market share from Snowflake, well, you're going to see that in the forecasts and in the actual revenues that Snowflake is making. And maybe we are seeing that because revenue is slowing materially from like over 100% growth just two years ago 
down to 36% growth now. Yeah, but that's also law of that's also the law of large numbers and it's a bigger company and I mean all of those SaaS players, right? All of them went through a similar yeah. growth curve as Snowflake. But if you take if you take your position literally, right, you'd you'd almost never invest in anything. Like there are what what could you truly say you know to such a deep level that well that the, the things you just said about Snowflake are not true. Like say EOS, right? You couldn't like ramp up an EOS production line. You're not buying EOS batteries personally. You could probably talk about the chemistry based on like an article or two you've read, but could you really like get into the detail of how those things are put together? I don't, um, that's not what I'm saying. So this Mm -hmm. is good. I'm glad we're clarifying this. Great point. And also it's a little weird because EOS might be the one company I know the most about. So it's a, a little strange, but I could, I'll take your point. With something like a battery, yes, I don't need to know how the battery is made, but I have a confidence in understanding why zinc batteries are a step up from, say, lithium. And I have a good sense of the overall demand, and I have a good sense, without the, the, the grains, of you know things like demand and supply and uh, why these things are needed. With Snowflake, I'm saying, even if you show me all of the numbers, I can't literally understand without doing massive amounts of work that I feel like are somehow beyond the horizon of understanding. If I put in an hour of my day to reading about battery chemistry, I will understand that even if I'm not a chemist. If I put in an hour of my day trying to understand the difference between the data lake and the data warehouse and like something that some new AI transformational thingamabob that Databricks has, but Snowflake may or may not have, I will not have the confidence to say, like, I get it. Like on a kind of holistic level, it feels to me like a very different category. Maybe not to you? Yeah, no, I disagree. Don't ask me to explain Snowflake's technology to you. Although I do know a bit from my old work days about data warehouses and data lakes. But like, if we, if we take your definition, like in, I, I wouldn't try and argue that I really understand any of the companies I own in my own portfolio. Like there, there probably is a distinction between consumer-facing companies and non-consumer-facing companies. Like, so for example, you and I both own a Tesla. And so I think we can say with some confidence that we understand the business of Tesla, at least its automotive division, pretty well because we're customers and they've had a bunch of our money and we see the software updates and we see how it's getting better or worse and how the windscreen wipers still don't work after you know a million iterations of software and then there's so that that's like a consumer facing thing and like you know apple and google and all these other companies to some extent fall into that category where we can make an effort to understand them and then there's everything else that's really kind of business to business now Snowflake's a bit of a funny one because if you really wanted to, you could become a customer of Snowflake. Like I, I signed up for CrowdStrike free Falcon free trial. I installed up my home PC last year, and I play actually used it and played with it for like a week because, like, part of the proposition of CrowdStrike was like it's aimed at small to medium enterprises as well as big giants. And they're trying to make it easy to turn on like world-class security capabilities. And after playing with it for a few days, I agreed that that was the case. They've done a great job of that. I had it operating. I sort of I had a layman's understanding of how this stuff was protecting my PC. You could do the same thing with Snowflake if you want to make that effort. That is actually, I think, to my point, uh, counterintuitively. I am saying to some extent that a layman's understanding via avenues like the one you just spoke is not enough in a sector in which snowflake is playing and that's something that i cannot fix unless i did either an obscene amount of work which at one point i during snowflake's initial i I did you know there's a bunch of experts online and i i did do it but now with things changing so fast even if I took the layman's approach, I don't think it would be enough is what I'm saying. And that's why to maybe land this plane, the too hard bucket, I think is a really important bucket for investors. Yep. Because once you've put in a lot of work to something, you know, there's there's a little bit of a gravity and law, sunk cost fallacy. And I might convince myself, well, I've already invested so much time and effort into this. 
then all of a sudden it starts feeling like it's getting out of your you know grasp but you you feel still stuck in it somehow and i'm saying if you have a too hard bucket and you're willing to say okay that's the thesis change it's not that the company's broken it's not that it won't necessarily succeed but I, i'm now relying on too much hearsay to make any reasonable call on it too hard take that cash and redeploy it and by the way right it's not a binary because yeah. it's not like to your point right it's not like you will ever understand anything completely but in the middle i certainly don't want to feel hopeless yeah it probably comes down to I think, I think okay i think we're coming to a point of agreement and maybe a way to pin it down because every investor will be different and I think the key thing is you have to understand the thesis and be able to revalidate the thesis every quarter, every year, whatever it might be. If you can't do that, you probably shouldn't own the company. So if part of the thesis for Snowflake is it has best in class technology and therefore it will grow, well, if you can't validate that through some mechanism that satisfies you, then you probably don't have a, a means to judge whether it's a good or a bad investment. But, and it's going to sound a bit dumb, maybe, but maybe that isn't the thesis for Snowflake. Maybe it doesn't matter that they have best-in-class technology. Maybe what matters is they're operating in a sector which is just growing so fast that everybody's going to grow. And they, as a company that helps take like masses, big data, and turn it into like actionable insights, if Databricks does it better... Well, maybe snow maybe that's not a negative for snowflake it's just another player if if and there could be other components to your thesis but every everyone every investor's gonna have their own thesis right absolutely and my pushback in that case is i agree with it but since snowflake's valuation is still very high remember what happens right yeah. what the way i've been operating over the first year of king of the jungle is saying in a market that's at all-time highs and the best of the best have extremely high valuations, then I want a large margin of safety in this moment. If I can't have that in Snowflake and I'm confused about my own ability to tell what's going on, then I'm putting myself, I think, in double jeopardy because little margin of safety and fog of war, yeah. so to speak. I totally agree with that. And I, I'm a big fan of the too hard bucket. Like there's so many incredible companies to invest in. If there's a bit of gray around anything like me, Airbnb a few weeks ago, like I, I basically, the, the, like a few hours before earnings dropped, I just decided based on my anecdotal experience, it was in my too hard bucket. So I got out just before earnings and it looks like I saved myself a scalping. So that Actually, can be helpful. I, I, <laughs> Maybe this is too fine a comb. I don't think that's technically a too hard bucket. I think what you saw in the Airbnb was evidence that what that you understood and pointed you in the direction of like, because nobody could fully predict the future, right? So that's not what I'm saying is too hard. I don't think Airbnb is like hard to understand. It's just you you put the data together and you interpret it as this is probably a losing investment. But that feels different from what I'm saying about Snowflake, right? I, I think sort of the same thing. Um, I, the reason I, cla I do classify that as being in the too hard pile was more like my whole thesis was the world is increasingly going to stay like remote working, work from home. And that whole thesis is in question, really, because the world seems to be going back to the office full time, pretty much. And I know there's a topic we're going to pick up in a future podcast around that that you want to pick up on. So th maybe that, like the social dynamics feels a bit too hard to me. I just don't know which way the world's going to go right now. And that was a core part of my Airbnb thesis because it was all about long-term right. stays, which is their competitive advantage. But that's why I would call that, if we're being technical, a broken thesis. Well, or maybe, maybe, maybe not. Like, I just don't know. That's, that's kind of the question I ask yeah. myself. Well, of course, but... We can't know the future, but what's at stake is that the thesis is in jeopardy. To me, equals possible broken thesis. But with Snowflake, the thesis might very well be in play. I just have no idea of evaluating anymore. Like I can't even make a reasonable guess at what I'm even talking about is the point. 
like because I don't understand the terms anymore. Like they've evolved so quickly, and like I haven't kept up in the sense. Anyhow, I think we're sort of saying sameish things, but with a little. Yeah, there's some good, good nuance there. And actually a good action for me, because I'm now going to go and properly review my own Snowflake holding, having looked at the numbers just now. Yeah, take take a look. Tell us what you find that that'll be, we could continue this conversation uh, mm-hmm. next week. I do want to say about the segment, like one last thing. It's not necessarily to my credit, but I, the journey I just mapped out for you listeners is going from a hyperbole thinking really that this is one of the best companies that will be around for the next 10, 20 years. Just their initial numbers were astounding. I knew it very well for a, quite a period of time. And to have arrived at this insight that now I don't understand it, it feels like, a, like I'm patting myself on the back, even though the conclusion is a disappointing one, one that I did not expect in one in which basically I was proven wrong and it ended up being a bad investment. But look, like in the age of AI and technology and change, I don't think this is going to be, I think this kind of thing will be more and more common. So put this in a like possibility of outcomes. You're you're absolutely right that probably technology more than anything, but really all companies, like the world is moving faster and faster at an increasing rate. And so if we're going to be tech investors, like you do want to keep an eye on the thesis even more closely and even more diligently because you could get a rug pull and it could happen very quickly. And maybe that's happening with Snowflake. Yeah, to be determined. Do you want to touch on where we are with the King of the Jungle portfolio before we wrap up today? Yes, I want to mention that uh, we're recording this on the uh, second of the month. The market is closed today, but every month we top up our portfolios with another cool hundred bananas. I want to I want to talk about this point again because $100 per month is an amount we chose because it ought not to be overwhelming to anybody. But lo and behold, it makes a difference and lo and behold on the first of the month I get excited. <laughs> <laughs> because <laughs> because up to now I have not been leaving much cash in the account because I have good places to put it. But this month I have three, four new ideas buzzing around, a couple of which I think you'll be surprised by. But I want to give you a little bit of a preview. Okay. I want to, and see if you could guess, I want to add more to a company I already have in my portfolio. There's only like two of those, right? But go on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I want to buy back a company I had sold earlier at a profit, and I want to invest in a company that has something like a $70 billion market cap, which is, uh, well, I do own Tesla. I do own a couple of percentages in Tesla, so I suppose it wouldn't be the first company, but I think you'll be surprised at what this is once I pull the trigger. All right. On. I, I wouldn't try and take a guess. I, I don't recognize half the weird ass tickers in the <laughs> King of the Jungle spreadsheet for the stuff you sold. So, anyway, it's going to be a busy month for Monkey. What are you planning on doing with your new cool 100? Uh, no, nothing. Like, I'm pretty happy having a bit of a cash allocation. Uh, I think I've got, what if I, how many, how many dollars have I actually got there? Like 14% um, of whatever two and a half thousand dollars is. Anyway, a couple of hundred bucks kicking around in cash. I haven't got any big ideas to chuck stuff into maybe at some point i will add to an investment because i do like to do that i haven't done that in the king of the jungle so far i think i've bought four five six seven eight nine ten eleven i've bought 12 things so actually 12 to 15 is kind of like the shape of a good portfolio i think so i'm almost at my like target portfolio composition maybe i'll be if anything i might be tempted to add to rocket lab because I've only got 7% in that. Okay. Well, the gap is back to, I think it's back to a contest, given how concentrated I am. We're, yeah. I think, about $300 apart. And so any good news from Coherus, which I think I will need till November, unfortunately, would potentially put me over the top. But there's also uh, a, uh, another catalyst coming up ahead for EOS. And EOS is already up... 130% in the king of the jungle. 
And I think if that if that hits, then we really would have a contest on our hands going through Halloween. So stay yeah. tuned, folks on Team Monkey. Do not despair. There's always another day. There's always hope. <laughs> if, uh, if you're EOS Catalyst, I'll say it again, it's like the 30th, it'll be a hollow victory because you, you squeezed those extra days out of me. But I'll take it. Do you want to tell us what your, uh, your other companies you're planning to add on? Or are you going to save that? I think I'm going to save that. I, I need to do a bit more due diligence about the big one. Is it one we've talked about on the podcast? No, this, the, this one is uh, brand new. Okay, all right. Is it a biotech? No. All right, okay then. All right, let's see. No, it's, a, it's actually an ancient company. Ancient. All right. Yeah. All right, very good. We'll look forward to hearing about those over the next couple of episodes. Once again, do give us a like and a subscribe, drop us a comment, give us a review on Apple or Spotify. That would very much be appreciated. You can also find us at wallstreetwildlife.com where you can get our 10 laws of the investing jungle download. Drop us a comment, ask us a question, and we will reply. And if it's exciting enough, we'll definitely give you a shout out on the show. Once again, best place to find us is on the Twitters. I'm at 7Luke Hallard. I'm at 7 Flying Platypus. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. <laughs> A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.